Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, let's get started. Uh, thanks for coming. It's wonderful to have uh, Kaushik Sen uh, visit MSR today. Uh, many of us know Kaushik's work, and uh, let me make this very quick. Kaushik is a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley, where he works on a number of interesting problems in programming languages and software engineering, the most notable one being that of concolic testing and execution. And today he's going to talk to us about a domain-specific language for testing concurrent programs. So over to Kaushik. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm going to talk about this DSL for testing concurrent programs. And this joint work with my student, Jacob Burnham, and my postdoc, Typhoon Elmas, who did most of the implementation, and also with my colleague, uh, George Nekula. And um, so to give you some background about this project, I, um, prim um, for the last several years, I've been working on automated testing tools and techniques. So how we, you can generate automatically test inputs so that you can get good coverage of your code or how can you explore systematically the, all the schedules of a concurrent program and so on. And one of the problems that we are facing, as you already know, uh, is the huge state space explosion or the path space explosion while we are trying to generate test cases. Um, now, most of the research is focused on how to prune or reduce the search space and get better coverage. Now, one thing we realized in the process uh, is that many times the computer is working very hard to find the right strategy and get good coverage, but the programmers uh, can provide this information very easily and quickly because they know about the program. They have written the program. So our question was, what would be, an, uh, what would be a simple and uh, easy way or framework that we can provide to the programmer so that they can express their intuition and ideas about the code and testing strategies uh, so that uh, the automated tools can utilize, exploit it, and get uh, coverage quickly. So we started this project. We started with this uh, project for called CloudFail for uh, distributed file systems like Hadoop, Cloudera, and Zookeeper. And they, there we came up with uh, a framework where you can write very small Python scripts, like five to ten lines of Python scripts, and you can. Uh, tell how to search the, all the kinds of faults that you can encounter in such systems or how you can do a partial order reduction in a very semantic way without telling the programmers that they are trying to do partial order reduction. So, we, I'm, so I'm not going to describe all this, um, this uh, the cloud fill project in this talk. Um, uh, subsequently, we started working uh, on for concurrent programs and we realized that there is no good unit testing tool for concurrent programs. And, uh, and our question was, how can you come up with such an unit testing tool that the programmers can use as easily as JUnit or XUnit? And that's what I'm going to talk about. And uh, we also have currently started working on um, techniques in wh using which we can annotate our code so that we can easily specify how we can search uh, the, for uh, generating data inputs for programs. And uh, these annotations are very simple. You don't have to write a predicate or an invariant. You have to just set some flags, and that is good enough to tell you how to search and get, get you good coverage. So today, I'm only going to talk about concurrent. And um, uh, I prepared the slides, actually, <laughs> yesterday. So there could be mistakes. So I, and I'll try to keep it uh, interactive, OK? So if you have any questions or anything, just feel free to ask, stop me. So uh, let's see uh, how, uh, if we want to, if, if our program is sequential, then how we are going to uh, test this program. So for this talk, I'll, I'm going to use this uh, Mozilla SpiderMonkey JavaScript engine, which has 121k lines of code. And it has some known bug. And we want to suppose test this uh, two particular functions, which has approximately 20k lines of code, JS new context and JS destroy context. Now, if we want to uh, uh, test this program sequentially, that is without running any thread, then it's pretty easy to write. You identify the all possible inputs to the program, you fix them, and you uh, make it a unit test. And, and one of the nice feature of this kind of sequential unit test is that if you run it multiple times, you get the same result. Either it will fail or it will be successful. Okay? So that is one of the nice feature that you expect out of any unit test or any system test. 
Unfortunately, uh, if you try to write a concurrent test for these uh, two particular functions, you have to create threads and you have to then run all these functions in parallel and so on. And this is exactly how it is run within the JavaScript engine. And you want to test this behavior. Unfortunately, uh, unlike the sequential version, we lose uh, one of the nice feature of testing, which is determinism. If we run it multiple times, we'll see some, some execution is failing and some execution it's not. So, uh, so that's not good because, um, uh, because we want our tests to be deterministic so that we can make it as a, as a regression suite. Now, what are the alternatives that people have uh, explored in this area? One popular technique which is really used widely is stress testing. As you have seen, uh, Chase also mentions the same uh, tools. Uh, stress testing, you create uh, thousands of threads and you run them all simultaneously and with the hope that if you run many threads for a long time, it's very likely that you'll hit some schedule that will uh, take you to the buggy uh, state. And it works quite well, but it doesn't give you guarantee. It might, the bug might happen on one, on one platform, it may not happen on other platform. So, uh, so this is very ad hoc technique. Um, in academia, we have model checking techniques that are uh, more systematic and exhaustive. And the idea there is why not enumerate all possible schedules of the program. But the problem with model checking is uh, too many schedules, so you cannot, uh, you cannot finish in a, in a limited time budget. And another problem with model checking is when you are trying to test something like SpiderMonkey or Apache or MySQL, one of the prerequisite, one of the requirement for model checking is that replayability. You should be able to replay a trace or a prefix of an execution so that you can do a stateless search of the state space. And that is very important. If you don't have uh, reproducibility, you cannot do model checking. You cannot give guarantees. Now, uh, we have seen that for large code like Apache and other things, it's very, uh, it's very impractical to assume that we can capture all sources of non-determinism and you can replay prefix uh, as before. So, uh, so that is a um, poor assumption and we want to relax the, that assumption. So this is model checking. In model checking, it's a push button technique. The programmers have no control over the model checking. They cannot specify, they can specify certain things in, in the recent tools, but in, in traditional model checking, they have no control over the search. Now here is a, one, another popular technique that people use and we actually looked into a lot of bug in the bug databases from Apache and MySQL and so on. Whenever someone has to post a bug in the bug database, uh, they will uh, give some textual description of the bug. Okay, take this function up to this point and then switch to this thread, execute this and then you put a slip statement so that you make a context switch to this thread and so on. And then they will write some kind of test, some kind of unit test. Well, they will sprinkle the entire code with slip statements with the right values for the times for the slips so that uh, they can come up with the right schedule okay, by uh, inserting this kind of delays. And, and, and this, is, this is actually the way people uh, do uh, write regression test for concurrent programs. And this is the popular technique. So uh, the problem with this sleep is it's not very formal. It's kind of ad hoc, but it works. Okay. So our question is, can we come up with a very formal language or a technique where we can write similar kind of test in a formal way, and also we can 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 we do model checking of those kind of test? Okay. So um, so we came up with this tool called uh, Concurrent, and that's what I'm going to describe. And I'm going to describe it using a um, using this running uh, benchmark which is a bug in the in the spider monkey javascript engine and if you you don't need to read the code and this is the test harness okay and if you run it using multiple threads using say 100 threads and if you come up with the right schedule then one of the assertion it it actually crashes but it can also be filtered out as an assertion and this assertion actually fails and and this is the bug we want to uh, uh, we want to create a unit test that will um, hit this bug. So each of the threads is working on a different context or the same one? Uh, they are working on different contexts, yeah. They, those are not shared, yeah. 
Yes, because test function is uh, passed as a function pointer to each thread. I see. So there's something else deeper that's going on. That yes. Even though, even though they're all different superficially, yeah. there's other things that they there, are, there are other things that are shared. and So I do not know much of the details about the bug and I don't have to, okay? And I'll show you. Well, I guess, I guess RT is common for all threads. Uh, RT, the variable RT is common. Yes, it's the runtime. Yes. That's common for all yes, threads. Yes, it's, it's common for all threads. That's the state. Yes. Yes, the context is a local variable, yes. RT is the runtime. And this is the bug. Uh, you don't have to again read it, uh, but it says that outside the GC log, now suppose that there are three threads A, B, C, thread A and B calls J's destroy context and thread C calls J, and then you take some spe very specific schedule, like you once does not touch this RT state and eventually calls this GC and something, okay? So it tells you some kind of scenario under which this bug could happen, okay? Uh, so we have some information about the bug. And let's try to create a unit test. So I'll introduce concrete our DSL using this uh, particular bug report, okay? And first let's assume that we just read this bug report and we just first read the first three lines and we realize that it will happen with three threads under certain interleaving, okay? That, I m that much I can infer by just reading the first two lines, okay? So, uh, so we'll write a concrete uh, DSL for this. And uh, before I go, uh, show you the exact uh, the DSL, uh, here is the, ar the architecture for this framework. Uh, you, uh, you have the software under test, okay? And you also have the insight or ideas how to test or how to create this bug. And then you write a test in the concrete DSL. The DSL is essentially C, C++. It's the language is C, C++, but it has some special macros which you can use to uh, uh, talk to the software under test, okay? And, um, and here is how it works. Uh, the software under test, uh, you, uh, you insert uh, instrumentation throughout the code so that it can generate events. And events have information about the state of the program. And these events could be like you are trying to read a memory location, or you are trying to write a memory location, or you are trying to enter a function, or you are trying to acquire a log, or so on, okay? And this uh, kind of instrumentations can be inserted automatically using pin tool or LLVM or so on, or it could be inserted manually so that you have better control over the model checking algorithm. And you only insert this kind of events uh, at the points where you believe there is a source of non-determinism, okay? Uh, for example, uh, you might say that within these functions only I want to generate events whenever you are trying to read this particular variable. I don't care about any other variable, any other read, there I don't uh, care about the context switches, okay? So this is how you instrument the software under test. It can be done both manually or automatically. And then you write a test in a concurrent DSL which is a C program. And, and the way the two communicates, whenever, um, whenever you are executing this software under test, it will generate event. And it will send that event to this uh, concrete DSL or this test script and it will block, okay? And the test script will take that event and based on the information that it has obtained using from that event, it will uh, do some computation. And at some later point, it will unblock that thread, okay? So that it can continue its execution. So this is the framework, how it works. Okay. And uh, so the, and, uh, what we are trying to do, we have this test script and it has some sources of non-determinism, I'll show you, okay? And what we are trying to do, we have this concrete script and we are trying to model check, it's a program which has so, uh, some non-determinism and we are trying to model check this script instead of model checking the actual program under test. Traditional model checking, what it does, it takes the actual program under test and it tries to model check it. We are flipping the problem we are trying to model check the concrete script, okay? So let's uh, uh, first uh, start writing some script to uh, find this bug. Uh, so it says that now suppose there are three threads. So first, uh, let us try to understand if this bug is due, really due to concurrency or if it is a sequential bug, okay? So for that, what we can do, we can s tell the system that execute each thread sequentially without interleaving with any other thread. And here is the script to write that fact. We, uh, 
we say that T A, T B and T C are some local variables in the DSL okay? and it has type T ID which is a thread ID and we call this macro which is called wait for distinct threads and it has the first argument which is 3 which says that wait for 3 threads okay? and, and event must satisfy a predicate which is thread starts which is true whenever a thread starts. Okay? So if, if you get an event which satisfies this predicate thread starts, then take that thread and, and that thread ID assign it to one of the TA, TB and TCs. Okay? So you start running the software under test and you also start running the script. The script will wait at this line until it uh, gets three events from the software under test which are already started and they will be assigned to these local variables TA and TB and TC. And then what I say that within a loop you have this condition whether you have ended or completed, finished the execution of TA, TB and TC. If you have not done that, then choose one of the threads from this set TA, TB and TC. So this is a point of non-determinism. Okay? So if you want to do an exhaustive model checking, you have to try out all possibilities of picking TA and TB and TC. And then what you do? You call this method called another macro which is provided by our framework, run the thread until, uh, uh, so pick this thread T and resume it, make it uh, continue with the execution and continue its execution until you encounter an event which is thread ends. Okay? And the other two threads TB and TC will be paused at that time. Okay? And then you you are done with this iteration, you go back and then you pick another thread and come. So in this way, you, you see that we are running each thread until completion without interleaving with any other threads that we have picked. Now another interesting thing about this system is we, we are only picking three threads. Okay? And uh, uh, there might be other threads and they could be interleaved, but we do not care. And uh, I'll actually comment on that later because I'll introduce something called tolerant model checking. Okay. So, uh, so if you, if you uh, run this test script along with the code, what will happen? It will explore six possible schedules of the program and it will form a tree if you look at all the schedules. So this is the first one, the red thread completes and then you pick the blue and then you pick the, and similarly at the beginning you can either, at this point you can pick the black thread and you can make it run until completion and so on. Okay? Yes. So what happens in a, if you're running a thread and it blocks waiting for... Very good question. So I'll get back to that. So there are possibilities. So in the semantics, in the semantics we have uh, two primitives. One is called select and the other is continue. And select has two semantics. It can either be unblocked uh, because you are receiving some event or it can time out. Okay? And you can set the time out and that is part of the semantics. So yes, um, otherwise it will deadlock, the system might deadlock. So we avoid that by... Um, so uh, so uh, if we run this six schedule, that's uh, pretty easy to test and, but unfortunately we don't see the bug. We don't see the assertion violation, then we are sure that it's because of concurrency and we need to interleave the threads. So what would be the most trivial way to interleave the threads and do model checking? It's pretty easy you just interleave all the threads. Okay? You do exhaustive model checking. And let's see how, can, how we can write a script to do that. It's pretty easy. Uh, you change this line. Instead of saying run uh, uh, thread until thread ends, you say that run it until you receive any of the events like read memory, write memory, or call function or thread ends. Okay? So when you run this script, what happens is Whenever you pick a thread, it will run until the next uh, event, which could be memory read or memory write, which are the visible events. And then you pick another thread. Okay? And if you make or go over all possible uh, choices for this choose thread, you get full model checking. Okay? And uh, you can implement any kind of search strategy, DFS or BFS or anything to do it. So, um, so what you see here is we just implemented a model checker using our script where you are trying to explore all the schedules in the program. And also one, one uh, point to note here is we are trying to model check this script. We are not trying to model check the program. Okay? But 
exactly, but the other program is still running. Yeah, the program is still running, but when you say about completeness, okay, we are not capturing all sources. In this case, we are capturing all sources of non-determinism of the original program because we are generating events for everything. But I'll show you an example where we are not trying to capture. And in that case, even if we are doing full model checking of the script, okay, you are not exploring all the schedules of the actual program. But in that case, you have other problems. Like I don't know how you would replay. Yes. So, so, so that is one thing. So replay is a big problem. And there, there, there are two ways to uh, we raise a flag if we cannot replay. And then we have various strategies to recover from it. We either prune that subtree. Or we continue and extend the frontier. Okay. Or uh, we also pro provide debugging information. The amount of non-determinism you have specified in your script is not good enough. You need to capture more sources of non-determinism so that you can make your test robust. Okay. Good point. Um, yes. Uh, so so you realize that that actually leads to this next slide. We, uh, in, in this kind of model checking, uh, we are just interested in certain events that we believe are crucial for reaching that bug, which are the crucial uh, scheduling decisions that are necessary for reaching the bug, and we only instrument them. So we must be able to tolerate other sources of non-determinism, which we call uncontrolled non-determinism. And in the process, when you are trying to replay, since we are doing model checking, stateless model checking, if you are trying to replay, uh, we might fail. And we need a way to recover from it and also inform the user that something you need to capture more sources. And also, uh, given we uh, allow to write user-specified predicates, we can also localize the search, say that only do the, um, the interleavings within this function or when this state is true or so on. Okay, and I'll show you some example. Uh, but in the uh, but uh, the the framework is uh, uh, powerful enough so that you can express various kind of traditional model checking algorithms like context bounded model checking, uh, partial order reduction, and so on, easily by writing scripts. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, let's try to make this uh, thing more interesting. Okay. Now let's try to write one more line in this bug report which says that threads A and B cause this JS de destroy context, and thread C cause this JS new context. And then if they interleave somehow, you hit the bug. So that is a little more, bit more information. Uh, because if we run this all schedule thing, it, took, it, it ran like millions of schedules. And, and then we found the bug. And that is not useful. Okay, That is like traditional model checking. So, uh, so uh, what it says is that thread C should stop here, and thread A and B should stop here, and then we try out all possible interleavings. That's what this uh, bug report is saying. Okay. So, uh, so let's try to express it in the script, and it's pretty easy. We say that uh, uh, wait for the three threads until they enter this function. Okay. So this is another predicate. Okay. Since we are capturing all the method. Uh, enter and mem read and mem write events. Uh, this uh, predicate we can check. And then we are saying that after you have uh, made the three threads TA, TB, and TC wait at this function, uh, let T and TB run further and make them wait when they enter this function JS destroy context. Okay? So we are kind of uh, uh, guiding the threads towards a particular schedule. Okay, so after the execution of this point in this script, uh, thread T and T B are about to enter this function just destroy context, and thread T C is waiting in this new context. And then we say that once you have reached this state, try out all possible interleavings, and that's what we have written here. It's same, and also we say that only try out the interleavings when you are inside this function's just destroy context. TB is in JS destroy context, and uh, TC is inside the new context. Okay, so outside that, do not try interleavings. Just take a default schedule, and you will be done. Okay, so this way we uh, we are restricted the set of schedules that we want to explore significantly. Okay, and now if we uh, so so uh, picturally, if you look at the computation tree, you'll see that. 
TC is here, PA is waiting here and TB and then you explode a tree. Okay? And we have pruned out all the state, the subtrees appearing here. Now, if we, if we run this, if we test with this script, we actually run less than 50,000 schedules and we hit the bug. And when you hit the bug, we also get a lot of information about the bug and we can use it to further refine the uh, test so that we can hit the bug within say 10 execution. Okay? So we can make the test script more specific. Okay? So, uh, uh, so now uh, here comes some more information and I will not uh, ask you to read it. But it essentially says that when you write some particular memory location or some state is true, then you start the uh, uh, interleaving threads. Okay? And, um, uh, and this is the, uh, and this is what we, uh, and as you can see, as I wrote before, I uh, inserted three more lines where I guided the threads more particularly to a particular schedule. For example, I let the TA run until it calls this GC and also it reads this particular memory location and so on. Okay? So I made the, uh, uh, the schedule more specific and then if we run it, uh, we hit the bug within 10 schedules. Uh, and uh, so this is good. So we refine the bug based on further information and, and, uh, and this is, yes. Scheduled, which seems like that seems like some special and it gets scheduled has very high priority. Which one? The, the, the uh, yeah, it has very high priority. Yes, it has very high priority, and uh, it's not only for, uh, we haven't uh, we we have done it for multi-thread programs, but we have also done it for multi-process systems. Okay, because when you are dealing with Apache and so on, and then we do inter-process communication. Okay, so whenever you have to send an event, you create a pipe and send it to the this DSL script. And also, uh, there are other engineering issues here. Uh, when you are running a server, you cannot restart the program again and again. Okay, you cannot restart the Apache web server for for fifty thousand runs. Okay. I mean, somehow when I look at this code, it sort of seems like whenever something happens, this concurrent thread is instantaneously available. To respond to that event. Yes. Yes. Uh, in, you know, like in a multi block or something like that, you know, you may have I mean, wait for distinct threads, wait for all of them to start up <coughs> and enter new content. <coughs> by the time this thread reacts, those may have just gone away. The other threads may have gone away. Yeah, but the model is not. Blocks, right? Right? Pardon? The system will block everything. The else. system, if you are waiting on whenever a thread sends an event, it will block. Oh, the thread will block. The thread will block. So, so whatever threads you are interested in, you are controlling them. And you are only controlling them at the scheduling points you care about. Because most of the times when you re look at these bug reports, you'll find that people don't care about all the threads and how so they interact. What I find confusing is then, but you said that there is, you have to somehow specify which threads you are controlling and which threads you are not. You also mentioned that there are things that you don't control as well. Yes, yes. Yes, so uh, the way we specify is it in using an existential quantifier. I do not care about which thread to wait for. Okay, they are kind of all similar to me. But as long as the even from that thread satisfies this, I'll make it TA. Okay, I don't have to pick a particular name for that thread. I don't have to say that I have to wait for thread GC. Okay. okay but then, so. so every thread will still be generating all events and sending that event. To this thread and say, oh, I'm not interested in that event. Yes, yes, yes. But the thread will still be, you know, every, every time there's an event, you'll be sending yes. and waiting for a response. Yes, and, and uh, the way actually the wait for distinct threads is implemented, I didn't show it, it's implemented using this two primitives, select and continue. Uh, it will immediately, if it is not interested in that particular event, it will say immediately continue so that it doesn't block that particular thread. Okay. But is the right way to think about this program as a thread which is actually executing, or is this just an abstract specification of the? No, it's a thread that is executing. So I guess I'm curious. Uh, I mean, do we need to think about ins insulating this thread from the actual program? Like, let's say you have a program which has a. It, it isn't memory safe. The the bug depends on what gets returned from malloc. You allocate some stuff here. 
actually the interleaving of this program, which you could introduce or remove bugs based on the execution of this thread. On this thread? On the you're, you're changing the program bit. I mean, you're, if you're calling any shared library, or even much more subtle things like layout of the stack, or I mean, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. just the execution of this thread as part of the original program actually could change the program behavior. Right, so, so there, is a, there is a risk of that. And, and in that situation, if you're worried about getting, uh, making, uh, corrupting the state space of this thing, you should run it as a separate process. But even that, okay. So you're, you're actually model checking the augmentation of the original program with this other thread. And there's, there's no just formal statement you could make that the original program behaves the same with or without this thread added. Uh, you, might, you might add or remove bugs by adding this other thread. No, you cannot. You cannot. But because the only thing that we are changing in the original program is timing. I mean, so memory layout wouldn't change? It could change because you have to, it, so you have to be careful with that. Another thread. I mean, let's say there's a bug in the thread scheduler. And I mean, that's what's impacting the yes. actual behavior. Now you're adding something to the thread queue. Uh, uh, right, and right. You have to instrument the whole program to generate all these events, right? That might itself change. Well, sure, sure. No, but there you could, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so there's some statement of the class of bugs that this detects. Yes, it, it, yes. It it's, like it's not identical to the... If you have two low-level bugs which, where there is a correlation between the test script and the thing, then, yeah, you may not be able to catch it, or it will be too non-deterministic. It will not be a robust test, yes. So there is a possibility. And one way to mitigate that problem is you create a separate process. And whenever you put the instrumentation, you make sure that you do not change the behavior of the original program too much. You just observe it, OK? <laughs> so that is, that, is the, that is the expectation. But this is Java, right? So it no, this is for C, C++. This is for C, C++. Okay. So, yeah, so after running this thing, we have more information about the particular bug. And then we can just write a straight line script, which has no non-determinism inside. And now if you run it, even on different platforms, it will hit the bug. Okay? And this you can put it as a, so it captures the essence of the bug. Okay? The key uh, scheduling decisions that are necessary to hit the bug. And everything else are uncontrolled. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, one thing I skipped over is uh, when, if you're trying to do model checking, you have to make sure that you take the same prefix, okay? And in this case, because of some other interleaving, that thread may not send the event that you're expecting, okay? And you might take it, or it might send an event that might change the path in your original, in your script, okay? And that is not an expected situation. So we, uh, we uh, actually uh, have something called checkpointing. Some of the checkpoints are placed automatically by the, uh, so these are the checkpoints. It essentially tells you what path you are taking inside this test script. Uh, ideally, you can put checkpoints after every <coughs> branching statements. For the true branch, you can say checkpoint true for the false branch. And that will give you an idea of what path you have taken before and whether you are uh, following the same prefix or not. Uh, but for certain things, like for wait until, uh, um, wait, uh, run, uh, wait for distinct threads where you have to iter loop over, you cannot put this kind of checkpoints for every branching statement. So we have a way to put it for only for the relevant branching statements, and the user can provide more checkpoints. And whenever there is a violation of the checkpoint, that is, you are not taking the same path, uh, we raise a flag to, uh, giving enough debugging information so that the user know that there is some sort of non-determinism which is failing, which is making this test weak or non-robust. So it, you need to instrument more and provide more information or make this test uh, stronger. Also, we... Uh, uh, so, so checkpoint means that you will actually check no, no, no. Checkpoint means uh, it's a it's like breadcrumbs. Okay, you spread the breadcrumbs whenever you run, and whenever you are trying to again re-execute, you see whether you are taking the same path by looking at the breadcrumbs. So you just um, you just log this checkpoint true. Whenever you call checkpoint true, you log it true. Okay, and whenever you so you get a sequence of true and false whenever you execute. And now, if you are trying to execute a prefix, you have to follow that particular sequence. 
Okay? And if you deviate from that sequence, you know that something has gone wrong. Some yes, it could. Yeah. It's it's so possible. Sure. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. We cannot be sure here. Yeah. So in such situations, there are two alternatives. One thing is you can just say that I give up and uh, prune that entire subtree and go one step higher in the in the computation tree and search from there, or you can add that trace to your uh, frontier and keep on extending the frontier if you are doing a breadth first search. So there are two alternatives to that. But we will just inform the user that it is no longer complete with the model checking is no longer complete with respect to the test script and that is all we do. Okay. So, um, Uh, these events, yeah. yeah, because if you look at uh, it's it's this event is enter this thing, okay, and this says that writes this memory, okay, and there is one read of this RT state, okay, and if you look at the report, you'll see that thread A and B calls this thing. Yes. Now, uh, is the uh, script that you produce an exact description of the original bug or is it another bug? No, it is it's this bug. This yeah, it is this one. It is this one and uh, just for the purpose of explanation, I took some information from the bug and gradually improved it just to show what process the programmer would follow. And, and do you see ways by means of which you can take this description directly generate that script? And Possibly, yes, if you can do natural language processing or something, I don't know. So that is beyond our scope. Okay. Programmer has to do it. Seems like you have gotten rid of some information that was probably extra here. So there is no mention of lock there. So maybe you didn't need it. Yeah, yeah we didn't understand. need it, yeah. That's how easy. Yes, we didn't need it because we also did this iterative process. We saw that, well, certain things don't matter. So we just skipped it. So it is a trial uh, error basis thing. But look at the possibilities, what you can do right now. Many times you might be wondering, I just want to interleave these two functions okay, under this particular context and that is all I want to test. Okay? And you can write a very five line script using that and you are done. Okay? So that is the best part. And for that you do not have to worry out, I am doing model checking, I am doing this and that. You can write it this very small C script and that is it. And also another thing is if you, uh, if you insert this kind of uh, events manually, which you can do once you have understood the bug perfectly because the amount of manual instrumentation that you have to add is like five or six lines. Okay? It makes the bug uh, portable. Okay? You do not need an infrastructure like an instrumentation tool or PIN or LLVM to reproduce that bug. Okay. So, you can just ship our concrete library which is portable, which is written in NCC and the instrumentation and you can see or oh, run it on your machine and you will be able to see the bug. So, that was one of the nice property about slip statements. It is kind of portable. Okay. You can run it and that portability is there in this framework. Okay. So, uh, now, uh, so, this is an example, a generic template for context bounded model checking. Okay you reach certain uh, function or certain state and then you do want to do one, one context bounding or two context bounding, uh, you can write this kind of script and we have written this kind of script used in our benchmarks and it was very useful. Okay. And uh, yeah, you basically keep uh, switching threads until the context bound has exhausted. So that is what it is checking. And there is a choose here which is telling whether I need to context switch or not. Okay. And similarly, you can express other model checking <coughs> algorithms. So the code is available. It is the DSL embedded in C++. It is available here. Uh, 
you can uh, write test both for unit testing. In unit testing, you, you write the harness and uh, the concrete script actually starts that harness. In case of system testing, they run a separate process, okay, and they communicate via pipes. And you don't have to restart your server and again and again. You can put two markers which says that process begin and process end, and that's it. So in the uh, original bug report, yeah. Yes, yes, he mentioned it, yes. But it was pretty easy. You call this thing and then you call this. It was like three-liner, yes. But uh, uh, I'll show you some of the things. Um, these are the, this I already showed you. So we applied this thing to the existing benchmarks like Inspect from Ganesh Gopalakrishnan's group the Parsec benchmark which has PBZ and small, some small uh, programs and also the RAD bench which we created uh, in collaboration with Intel. And it contains uh, Memcached, Apache, HTTP server, MySQL and the JavaScript engine both from Chrome and Firefox. And for each b benchmark we, uh, uh, we took a bug which is real or which comes from an existing work, okay. and um, we also, uh, in the process, we also came up with a number of patterns for this script that are commonly used in writing these things, okay? Uh, and actually, programmers can directly use them and instantiate them and use it for writing the test. One is search all, search everything, search all interlivings. Another is search in some particular function, or it can be search in some function with your own uh, instrumentation. And the th uh, fourth one is search in function with some context bounding, okay? So for, uh, for uh, reads and writes to memory, uh, you still, if you are not manually inserting re these uh, read mem and write mem events, uh, you still need someone to inject those events, right? Yes, so, so if, if you say that I am interested in the read mem and write mem and call method, then you have to use an instrumentation tool. Okay. So when you are trying to create this test script by trial and error and make, trying to make it precise, you can use the print instrumentation to insert them automatically. Okay. And then also you can specify the exact schedule. And uh, this, this is just some statistics about the programs on which we have run and, and uh, the bugs that were existing bugs. And the way we evaluated, we tried to see if we can make a very concise and easy to read test for each of these bugs and how easily we can write them. Okay. And here are the, some of the results. Uh, for the small benchmarks, you can see that um, the lines of code in the test script is pretty small. It's like five lines of code, five lines of test script you have to write. And it's pretty easy to understand. And also the amount of manual instrumentation just to make it portable you have to do is like three maximum, okay, and that's good enough. And also for each of the benchmark we uh, apply the different kind of heuristics, search all, search uh, large steps where we insert this manual instrumentation and also can, for most of the bugs we are able to come up with the exact schedule, trial and error. And, uh, and in all the cases we managed to actually create the bug and make it portable. You can now run it on Mac and you can reproduce the bug. That is another nice aspect. And this is for the large benchmarks where you have a process running, multiple processes, multiple threads, large code base, and there also we manage to uh, create the bugs. And as you can see, the maximum lines of code for the scripts is 11, even for very complicated bugs. And also to make them very portable, the maximum we instrumented manually, and for one case it was 14, and that's the maximum. And uh, and for most of the benchmarks, we are able to create an exact schedule that hits the bugs. So manual instrumentation is where you are basically going and saying create these events at this point. Yes, 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 because we after some. After doing this uh, search in function and search in bug, we figured out these are the only events that matter, okay? And that's where we need to do. So then we just insert it so that we can make it portable. What's an example of places where you have to do manual instrumentation? Yeah, so I showed you in the in that this example, uh, if you 
so for example in this case you only care about the entry of the this function uh, entry of this function read of this memory location and also we know the line number for that memory location so we can insert and this memory location and this function so we added like uh, six instrumentation points just before calling this function calling this function reading this state <coughs> calling this function and so on okay. so uh, yeah. yeah so uh, so this is my final slide uh, so at one end the most popular technique for uh, controlling the schedule or making a bug repro is slip and believe it or not it's it's the best technique nowadays and it's used okay. uh, they put lots of slip statements with the right parameters for timing and they can hit the bug on the other hand you have model checking where you can uh, search everything and what we try to do take a middle path so that we can make slip statements more formal and also exploit ideas for model checking so that we can make bugs. So it's nothing like very formal or sophisticated, but it's a very simple tool that programmers can use and it's practical. So that's what we showed. And we also flip the model checking problem. Instead of model checking the program, we model check the script. That is another key idea. Thank you. I'm just curious, have you also thought about this as a runtime system? Like what kind of overhead do you have to actually run the program with the, with the instrumentation? Uh, so if, if we are not, so it depends how much instrumentation you are doing. So if you have a lot of instrumentation, you have overhead of like 10 to 100 times. But if you have this small amount of instrumentation, like six lines of instrumentation, it's like 10% or even less. Because I guess the other useful thing of precisely specifying the schedule is that you could just avoid those schedules. Yes, yes. So run the schedule to avoid the bug, kind of as a patch. I don't know if you saw, there's some work. Yes, on yes, right, right. We did a few years ago called Kendo that was trying to enforce Ken. the deterministic schedule. Yes. But we didn't have any way of uh, basically specifying which schedule you should enforce. So if you want the same deterministic behavior on all systems. Have, so you keep the counter. And, uh, right, right. So yeah. there are ways of optimizing yeah. instrumentation, basically, to yes. like have the minimal overhead for keeping track of these events and enforcing the schedule. But it could be a nice thing. I mean, before the bug is fixed, can you just specify that the, the runtime should avoid this schedule? Might be an interesting way to do that. Yes, so that's that's a good idea. You can always do that and avoid the bug. Yes. So when you define your scripts, uh, you also need to figure out the parameters to your sleep, right? So how do you figure that out? No, we don't have any sleep statements. We have some timeout uh -huh. associated. Timeout, yeah. Select and it's fixed. I think we figured it out a particular number that but you can. That, makes, that would make a difference, right? That would make a difference. Yes, that could slow down the system. But if your if your test is robust enough, you do not hit timeout that often. And whenever you hit a timeout, we know it's a bad thing going on. We raise a flag. Timeouts are not good. If you hit the timeouts, it's not a good scenario. This is related. So if your test is Yes, right. Because if I'm writing another, and I found another bug, now I need more instrumentation. That should not break my earlier test. Right. And that should be fixed. Yes. No, no, no. So, so I don't instrument the whole program. I just put these six <laughs> events. And now I find another bug, and I, I now I need five more events. Now when I run the first test, I'll get 11 events instead of six. Mm -hmm. So things have changed, but that shouldn't. Uh, well, well, yeah, actually, uh, if I'm thinking, um, Mm, then I have to be careful because if you insert another event, that might be dependent on some interleaving and it might, uh, it may not be robust actually. Let me rephrase it. Okay. Yes. Because the new event that you are inserting might be dependent on some other threads and it might change from time to time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that could make it non-robust. Yes, but that uh, event could be a might adversarial be. event. And okay, it might make your script go on yeah. some other part. Yes. Yes, no. So, these tests refer to these events, right? The 
demons could be very abstract or concrete in the sense uh, they could be like uh, uh, black box events which could make sense for all implementations or could be more like white box events specific to a particular implementation. So your test case itself, I was wondering how often you end up with test cases that are specific to the current implementation versus uh, so for more abstract test cases. So, so that's a very good question and um, I showed you the most comp one of the most complicated test cases that we have written. And as you see that it's very simple, it's very uh, black box kind of thing. Just enter this method which is not implementation specific. So it reads and writes to specific parts of data? Yes, but it's, it's specific to a program. It doesn't depend on the, oh yeah, it depends on the implementation, right, but it de doesn't depend on the platform, yes. Yes, reads and writes could be, yes. Yes, but if you say that the reads and writes are kind of any reads and writes, then it's kind of independent. Yeah, I was just wondering in terms of your, the examples you had, in your test suite, could you say how many were more black boxes and versus? Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I wanted to do that uh, study. Like, if you take a patch of that bug, whether it's still a regression suite or not, in future versions. So we didn't manage to do it. So we still need to do it and see. But that's a interesting thing because we are claiming that it's a regression suite, and if it is too much implementation dependent, then it's useless. So this is outsider's question doesn't apply only to, to this talk, but I mean, has someone characterized the completeness of bugs you can detect that appear only when you go from sequential to concurrent, but may or may not be due to interleaving? I mean, one example is you have a volatile variable. It gets cached locally in a parallel setting, and that, that leads to a bug independent of the interleaving. So I mean, if you were to run the program sequentially, there's no bug. Uh, if you run concurrently, not because of the interleaving, there's a bug. And so actually this might not find that behavior unless it's scheduling an adversarial schedule of processes across cores or across machines. I don't know, I mean, is there something, has uh, someone talked about completeness? Well, I, I'm not sure, but if, if you're worried about those kind of bugs, you have to kind of uh, take that into account, like model the cache or... Uh, say, consider other kind of memory models? Well, you could have a model where we consider all interleavings and also all assignment of yes. those interleavings to processors. That'd be yeah. the next natural extension. Yes, it's like, yes. It's not only the interleaving, it's the schedule and yes. assignment to processors. Yes, yes. So you have to model it. Mm -hmm. we, right now, it just models the interleavings and that's it. Any other questions? Thank you.